Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Geography 341, Weather and Society. I'm Dr. Zach Hilgendorf, and in this lecture, we're going to be talking about atmospheric composition. In the last lecture, we talked about the structure of the atmosphere, so looking at the troposphere, stratosphere, mesosphere, thermosphere, and atmospheric pressure and density. In this lecture, we're going to be talking about what the atmosphere is composed of. So let's go ahead and dive into it. So primarily, uh, air is a mixture of a number of discrete gases, each with their own physical properties, and in which varying quantities of tiny solid and liquid particulates are suspended. Composition is not constant, however. If we removed all the particulate matter, water vapor, and the other variable components, uh, we would find a pretty stable makeup for about the first 80 or so kilometers within our atmosphere. Particulates, that's where we're gonna kinda start off here, are little liquid droplets and solid particles suspended in the air. How does that work? Uh, so before we dive into the gases, let's talk about particulates here. So suspension in a fluid, you can see the forces at work here, the force of gravity, the force of density, buoyancy forces. Suspension refers to the process of keeping an object aloft in a fluid. More often, we think of the term suspension in terms of the suspended load of a river, or the suspension of particles in sediment, in sediment transport by the wind. Atmospheric suspension takes the uh, latter concept a step further, where suspension of a particle in a fluid, in this case, the fluid is our atmosphere, can extend kilometers into the atmosphere. Winds aloft can maintain particle suspension for thousands of kilometers. A really good example of this is the dust plumes that you'll see from transport events in Africa. These dust storms and plumes can serve as nuclei for storm development in the Atlantic, which can evolve into tropical storms, into hurricanes that are actually impacting the east coast of North and South America. So how can a particle stay up in the atmosphere like that? Well, you'd think it would just fall back down to Earth, but for very small particles, such as dust, they have a very low terminal velocity. And it's very easy to maintain that suspension aided by rising air parcels. So that's just kind of a brief touch on suspension as a property here. Here are some examples of atmospheric particulates. You can see other liquid and solid particles, what we call aerosols, water droplets, and ice crystals. More natural things uh, we see here, like sea spray, the smoke uh, and things given off by wildfires, dust storms, which are also called haboobs, it's just a fun word, uh, and then volcanoes. Um, so all of these are natural in uh, ways to increase uh, particulates within the atmosphere. We do a good job aiding that, obviously, by pollution uh, within our atmosphere from things like industry and transportation. These add tons of soot and uh, particles within into the atmosphere from the combustion of many of our uh, contemporary modern equipment. So let's take a step back and go to gas. So particulates are the things, like I said, that serve as nuclei for uh, things like cloud development formation, for example. Gases, uh, don't, <laughs> um, but they serve quite a different purpose. So we've got two different types of gases for the most part, permanent gases and variable gases that we're gonna be concerned about. The atmosphere is just a cloud of gas and suspended solids extending from Earth's surface out thousands of miles or thousands, hundreds of kilometers, becoming increasingly thinner with distance, but always held down to Earth by our gravitational pull. So the atmosphere is made up of these layers that we've talked about that hold the air we breathe, protect us from outer space, and hold moisture, gases, and tiny particles. We live in a protective bubble. Um, this protective bubble consists of several gases uh, with the top four making up about 99.998% of all gases in the atmosphere. By far, the most common is nitrogen. See here, these are our three dominant gases, uh, nitrogen, oxygen, and argon. 
Um, nitrogen dilutes oxygen and prevents rapid burning at the Earth's surface, which is pretty cool. Um, <laughs> we need it. We need it to make proteins. Um, it aids in heat capacity and momentum exchanges. Uh, it fertilizes our crops. Um, it's an important nutrient that we need. Oxygen is used by all living things and is essential for respiration. It's also necessary for combustion and burning. Um, if you did not have oxygen, you would not really have fire. Um, argon is used in things like light bulbs, um, which can be very important, uh, but it doesn't really serve much of a role in the regulation of our atmosphere. And the one that we don't have on here um, the other of the four, and we'll touch on these in the variable components, is carbon dioxide, uh, which basically acts as a blanket and prevents the escape of heat into our outer atmosphere. When we get to variable gases next, you can see the rest of our table here. Variable gases make up this component here, this bottom square. Uh, carbon dioxide, neon, water vapor, aerosol particles, methane, ozone, particles in general, just kind of the rest of the bulk uh, grouping here. Carbon dioxide uh, absorbs infrared light, so it's we, it here contributes to global warming, but without uh, greenhouse gases, we would not have a habitable planet. We're just adding to those greenhouse gases, which are leading to the warming uh, across our planet. Um, it is a product of combustion, so when burning occurs, carbon dioxide is one of those things that are given off. Um, and it's all part of this big cycle. So we call this particular cycle the carbon cycle. Uh, we can see a bunch of different examples of the carbon cycle here, from forests storing carbon in the top to uh, carbon being sunk within our oceans, for example given off by wildfires or volcanoes, decomposed from trees, breathed out by us. Here we can see a better example of uh, kind of a more holistic view of the carbon cycle, going from things like vegetation uh, on that far left side there, um, soils, these are storing carbon, uh, crops are giving off carbon and storing carbon, wetlands are as well, um, industry is really just adding carbon to the atmosphere. Um, it can fall out and be stored and taken up by phytoplankton and zooplankton and then settle down into the uh, marine sediments below us, be converted into things like fossil fuels or stored within fossil fuels, and then the cycle just kind of continues here. So cellular respiration or decomposition are two of the ways that carbon dioxide is emitted. Uh, from organic components, whereas wildfires, aerosols in uh, volcanoes and sea spray, those are ways that they're given off from natural components. They're stored uh, in all of these different components here, so stored in forests, stored in reefs and uh, marine life and plankton stored within our oceans in general, stored within crops, but also given off by crops. Again, given off by pollution within our atmosphere, by deforestation and burning. And we've been able to monitor this uh, thanks to this gentleman right here, Charles Keeling. Now, if you're in my climatology course, you better know who this is. Um, but if not, we'll talk about Charles Keeling a little bit more here. Um, worked at the Mauna Loa Observatory, uh, Earth's System Research Laboratory's Global Monitoring Division, and developed something called the Keeling Curve. And the Keeling Curve looks like this. Uh, this is the full record ending, uh, according to my watch, about a week ago. Uh, it's a measurement of the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere made atop Hawaii's Mauna Loa Observatory or, uh, volcano, starting back in 1958. This is the longest running such measurement of carbon dioxide concentrations in the world. Um, and this is just ambient measurements. And we can see a pretty drastic increase from roughly 318 or 315 
uh, parts per million back in the 1950s. It was lower prior to the start of the Industrial Revolution, but this is when our record starts. Uh, going all the way through to now we're at about 450, almost 100 parts per million. We've increased our carbon dioxide concentrations uh, since the 1950s from when I was born, just for reference and example here, uh, we're looking at around, I'd say about 347 parts per million or so. Um, so this is a very important thing because these types of greenhouse gases uh, increase our weather, or sorry, increase our, our temperatures on our surface which can lead to more turbulent mixing, which can lead to more drastic weather, which can lead to higher moisture content. It can lead to a whole lot of different things. We'll talk about that as we kind of go on in the semester here. Next one we're going to look at, water vapor. Uh, it absorbs infrared light, again, contributing to the greenhouse uh, effect. Exchanges with liquid and solid form, exchanges with life, it's a product of combustion. Really, really, really important. Without water and water vapor, we would not be here. So where does it come from and where does it go? Cotton Eye Joe. <laughs> Sorry, I had to. Uh, things like condensation and evaporation or condensation and transpiration uh, lead to the exchange of water from our surface to our atmosphere. Uh, in fact, this whole big broad thing is something we call the water cycle. You probably learned about this uh, way back, um, maybe in middle school, maybe in if you took 104, you learned about it in Geography 104. A lot of STEM courses teach the water cycle. But the water cycle is just looking at this big exchange and uh, movement of water from our oceans and lakes and streams into our atmosphere, raining back down, being stored in ice caps, being moved subterranean, so through the groundwater uh, or through the, the subsurface of our planet. Just kind of looking at how that functions. So things like evaporation, condensation, precipitation, and surface runoff, and groundwater flow drive the water cycle. From a budgeting perspective, we can look at it this way. So here's just another rendition of the water cycle. Uh, if we were looking at evaporation from the surface of the ocean, we're looking at maybe 413 units of input versus 73 units of input uh, from evapotranspirative processes over the land. Condensation over the ocean, about 373 units are going back into the ocean in the form of precipitation. And 113 units are uh, going back into the surface of the land from evapotranspiration or from uh, precipitation. Obviously, those don't add up if you're just looking at the ocean or just looking at the land. Well, there is uh, water moving because it's not constrained to just being over the ocean or just being over the land. It's moving uh, horizontally across uh, through as water vapor and clouds. So things, the surplus over the ocean can rain out over the land and et cetera. And then we've got groundwater flow contributing about a unit and stream flow contributing about 39 units back into the ocean. So that's kind of our budgeting perspective. The next really important gas uh, that we want to talk about is methane or CH4. It absorbs infrared, uh, so it is also a contributor to our greenhouse effect. Um, we are adding lots of methane to the atmosphere from a number of different sources, um, so kind of aiding into that, uh, the negative aspect of the greenhouse effect. Um, we exchanges with life. It's a source of CO2 and H2O or water. We see it in uh, rather small quantities, about uh, 1,820 parts per billion uh, in respect to things like carbon dioxide, which we monitor in parts per million. Now, naturally, uh, methane additions into the atmosphere come from a number of different natural sources. Uh, one of the most prominent of those being ruminants, uh, basically 
animals with multi-chambered, oftentimes four-chambered stomachs. And methane is a byproduct of the fermentation of the, basically the material that they're eating decaying within their gut biome. <clears throat> so there are microorganisms um, in there that are helping break these things down because ruminants themselves don't have the enzymes to break down the cellulose in much of the material that they eat. Think of things like grasses. Um, so that microbiome within their multi-chambered stomach helps break that down. As they break that down, they, through flatulence, farting and burping, I'm a child, I'll still laugh at that, um, through things like farting and, 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 and just passing gas in general, flatulent uh, processes, we'll say, uh, they're adding that methane into the atmosphere. Now, in a natural perspective, it can be a relatively small amount. But when you consider all of the uh, concentrated animal feeding operations, we call CAFOs, uh, that are across the world. We have you know, tons and tons and tons of them here in the United States for things like cattle production, uh, for things like beef and dairy. Well, you're adding concentrated amounts to the atmosphere then. Now, the largest natural or natural natural, pardon me, largest natural source comes from wetlands. And the decaying uh, plant material within wetlands, CH4 oxidizes H2O and CO2, you see there, but wetlands and uh, kind of that anaerobic de decomposition zone within them um, can really aid or add methane to the atmosphere. And termites, things like termites are also uh, adders based off I think of these as almost little like methane chimneys based on how they're decaying the material to build their uh, termite mounds, etc. As I alluded to then on that last slide, agriculture is a major contributor. Uh, so these here, what you're seeing in the, the picture on the left is one of those CAFOs, or concentrated animal feeding operations. On the right, you're seeing rice production. So a lot of ways um, kind of mimics a wetland. So some of these, you know, primary agricultural production sources across our world are basically taking natural methane sources and concentrating them into production. So here, you know, because of the byproduct of fermentation within the gut biome, the cattle are burping out massive quantities of methane into the atmosphere relative to historic rates. And likewise, within things like rice paddies, uh, we're seeing a lot of uh, methane influx there as well. Extraction is another primary uh, contributor there. You're seeing flares from oil and gas fields off on the right-hand side there. Uh, basically, we're burning, we're trying to burn off uh, the, you know, and, and depressurize uh, these operations by which you see there, that little flare, but there are methane leaks from that. Um, in fact, there's a very famous nighttime photo of the United States where uh, most of North Dakota is glowing like the surface of the sun, at least it looks that way. And what you're actually seeing is thousands and thousands of these flares. Um, if you think about that, covering a large chunk of Western uh, Central North Dakota, you think of all the methane coming from that, well, it's a pretty big contributor. Landfills are another one. If you think of all the decay or the decaying matter underneath uh, things like sanitary landfills we see here are being buried over. And these pipes that you're seeing here are uh, so that methane can leak through. Um, it doesn't pressurize within that and rupture or anything dramatic like that. So we can see here, this is a, uh, our Keeling curve on the left again, um, and our global monthly mean methane production. Uh, so as far as records go, the CO2 uh, concentration record at Mauna Loa goes back eh, 20 or so years more um, than the global monthly mean methane concentrations. Uh, 
uh, that you're seeing here. Notice that there is a difference from parts per million in CO2 to parts per million in CH4, um, but they're both doing the exact same thing, rising pretty dramatically. And if you were to extend this record back, uh, especially back through the Industrial Revolution, you'd, you'd really see uh, these values kind of skyrocketing over the last uh, century and a half of human habitation uh, in its prime here on the on the planet. And then ozone, um, we have o or ozone or O3, uh, 10 parts per billion parts per billion to 10 parts per million. Uh, it's a major absorber of ultraviolet and infrared radiation. That's really important if you're in the stratosphere because that is the main thing that intercepts the harmful rays of uh, UVB radiation coming into our planet. However, surface level ozone is a lot more problematic, contributes to things like smog, um, and uh, there's a lot of health concerns regarding it, um, breathing it in and whatnot. And it's also very reactive to a lot of other gases. So it, in the stratosphere, uh, ozone is created primarily by ultraviolet radiation. When high energy ultraviolet rays strike ordinary oxygen molecules, or what we call O2, they split the molecule into two single oxygen atoms known as atomic oxygen. A freed oxygen atom then combines with another oxygen molecule to form a molecule of ozone. There's so much oxygen in our atmosphere that these high energy ultraviolet rays are completely absorbed within the stratosphere. Ozone is extremely valuable, as I would mentioned, since it absorbs a range of ultraviolet energy. When an ozone molecule absorbs, pardon me, excuse me, even low energy ultraviolet radiation, it splits into an ordinary oxygen molecule and a free oxygen atom. Usually it quickly rejoins to form another ozone molecule. Because of this ozone oxygen cycle, these harmful rays are continuously converted into heat. Natural reactions other than the ozone oxygen cycle uh, also affect the concentration of ozone in the stratosphere. Because ozone and free oxygen atoms are highly unstable, they react very easily with nitrogen, hydrogen, chlorine, and bromine compounds that are found naturally in Earth's atmosphere. For example, single chlorine atoms can convert ozone into oxygen molecules, and this ozone loss balances the production of ozone by high energy ultraviolet rays striking the oxygen molecule. So it's just an idea of kind of how this ozone actually uh, is created and, and cycles through uh, within the atmosphere. And here you can kind of see uh, stratospheric ozone. There, the stratospheric ozone layer is roughly about 20 to 30 uh, kilometers above the surface is its greatest concentration. Um, UVA gets through that ozone uh, layer based off of the, uh, primarily off of the wavelength of UVA versus UVB and UVC. Um, UVB and UVC are wholly or almost wholly intercepted by ozone within the stratosphere. Now, surface level ozone or smog is a different story, and that's actually adding to the uh, heating preferentially within the lower aspect of the troposphere. Uh, and we'll get into it maybe a little bit later, but um, some of the big reasons, uh, and this is more just for informative aspects, some of the big reasons that the greenhouse gas or the greenhouse effect has been so negatively associated is because we're adding so many greenhouse gases to the lower portions of the atmosphere. Without the greenhouse effect, we wouldn't have a planet to live on. It would constantly scorched. Um, but because of the greenhouse effect, we have a nice warm planet. Now, if there was, for example, uh, an increase in solar activity to account for the fact that we're seeing uh, ubiquitous warming across our planet, then we would see consistent warming throughout the entire atmosphere. But we don't see that. We only see the warming concentrated within the lower portions of the troposphere where we live. Kind of a smoking gun, if you will, for anthropogenic climate change driven by anthropogenic, anthropogenic activities at the surface of the planet. So just kind of an informative uh, tangent there. But here you can see just kind of a picture of smog. Uh, lots of nitrous, nitrous oxides and volatile organic compounds. Lots of sunlight, little wind, you get this smog layer that'll form. 
uh, and it's you know over major cities. Think of Los Angeles, San Francisco, Beijing. Um, all over, we're, we're seeing this type of uh, formation due to, unfortunately, um, the uh, massive influx of pollution into our atmosphere. So that's all for atmospheric composition. Uh, we talked about permanent gases, variable gases, particulates, the carbon cycle, the relationship between CO2 and CH4, and ozone. So uh, we will continue on in the next video, but I will see you then and hope you have a great day. Thank you.